Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. This is Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. Come on, let's all go to the lobby. Because people are staring at us listening to these shows while we're in the theater. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Hello, and welcome to Reimagined Radio. I'm John Barber. In this episode, entitled Storytelling with Sounds, we will explore how sounds have contributed to storytelling throughout human history and listen to some examples of storytelling with sounds. Storytelling, it seems, has evolved with human beings and today is woven into the fabric of our lives. How often, for example, have you been asked, Please, tell me a story. But what is storytelling? Simply defined, storytelling is constructing and sharing a narrative of events in such a way as to engage the listener's imagination. Many scholars believe storytelling began as a way to explain the sounds prehistoric humans heard in nature, like thunder. In this sense, Storytelling was a way to establish relationships between humans and the surrounding world. Storytelling may have developed as rhythmic drumming or mimicry of bird and animal sounds. These sounds were incorporated into words and then speech and eventually language. Over millennia, storytellers constructed and spoke aloud epic stories from formulaic word combinations, often accompanied by music or other sounds. Storytelling was not only entertainment, but also information, a fundamental mechanic useful for making sense of human experience. Arguably spoken, oral storytelling provided one of the earliest forms of collective communication and memory and may have provided an origin for literature. Wat, we gardena in yerdagum, theod kuninga thrum yafrunnan, hu da adalingas ellen fremadon. That was the first line of Beowulf, the epic Anglo Saxon tale of battle between the heroic warrior Beowulf and a bloodthirsty monster called Grendel. Scholars suggest that Beowulf was told orally for several centuries before it was first preserved in writing, somewhere between 975 and 1025. Translated, that first line says, We have heard of the might of kings, and how those nobles performed courageous deeds. With that first line, the storyteller refers to previous tellings of the Beowulf story, and so attaches the present telling to community history, prompts listeners' memories, and captures their imaginations. Storytelling is a way of carrying the past into the future. From the start, storytelling relied on the sounds of the storyteller's voice. Other sounds might have been added for narrative effect or to aid memory. Storytelling with sounds, whether voice or other sounds, or a combination, evolved into participatory rituals and reenactments and eventually into theatrical and dramatic performances. To be or not to be, that is the question. For dramatic performances, actors spoke scripted dialogue, which was often augmented by sound effects. Shakespeare, for example, used sounds of thunder and historic battles to augment his plays. 
Storytelling with sounds evolved further with the arrival of motion pictures. Early silent movies featured live musical accompaniment, which substituted for the unheard narratives spoken by actors on screen. And some movies crossed boundaries and became radio. In 1930, German filmmaker Walter Ruttmann created a collage of words, music fragments, and other sounds to represent a weekend in Berlin. Weekend was presented in theaters as a sound-only experience. No images were projected on screens. Weekend was also broadcast on radio and for that reason is sometimes called a radio play. Listen now to Weekend. Hello, Polanyi. Bitte dön auf 42440. Erdkönig. Ich hab bitte mir das. Bitte. Wer reitet zu spät? Durch Nacht und Wind. Es ist ja. Fräulein, Sie haben mich ja falsch verbunden. Döner auf 42. Vier. Vier mal vier ist. Vierter Stock, Spielwaren, Schuhwarenladen, Lebensmittelabteilung. Bitte erlauben Sie mir doch. Und erlauben wir uns? Erlauben Sie mal, wie ebenso dringend, wie höflich. Hallo, Fräulein. Mein Sohn. Aber Fräulein. Mein Sohn. Es ist zum Rasen werden. Kollege kommt gleich. Na Gott sei Dank. Hallo. Komm. Mein Vater. Achtung. Hallo.
Na also bitte. You are listening to Reimagined Radio. This episode is called Storytelling with Sounds. I'm John Barber. We will continue after these words from our sponsors. AARP Foundation Tax Aid in Clark County is currently taking appointments for tax preparation and e-filing services at no charge. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, preparation will be contact-free. TaxAid is an all-volunteer organization whose tax counselors are trained and certified by the IRS. To make an appointment in Washington, the number is 360-302-2641. And in Oregon, call 211 and ask for TaxAid. More information at aarpfoundation.org forward slash TaxAid. Programming like this is brought to you through the generous support of our founding sponsors at ADCO, Commercial Printing and Graphics, Clark County's local print shop since 1993. ADCO features stationery, posters, flyers, tickets, business cards, stickers, catalogs, and much more. Print on anything and mail anywhere. Learn more at adco1.com. That's adco1.com. Big thank you to Craft Cannabis, formerly known as New Vansterdam, for their ongoing support of KXRW Vancouver Radio. Craft Cannabis is Vancouver's premier cannabis market for those 21 years of age and over. Visit craftcannabis.com to view an order from their full online menu, and they offer in-store, curbside, and touchless pickup to better serve you. Craft Cannabis is located in the Heights Shopping Center on the corner of Mill Plain and Andreessen Road. Open 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., 365 days a year. More information available at craftcannabis.com. Welcome back to Reimagined Radio. In this episode, we are exploring storytelling with sounds. We just heard Weekend by Walter Ruttman, a movie shown in theaters without pictures and broadcast on radio as a story told with sounds. Radio, with its content comprised entirely of sound, is well suited for storytelling. Early radio programs offered recitations, dramatic performances, and music, all forms of storytelling with sounds. Even news reports, because of the inability to broadcast from remote locations, were dramatic presentations performed in broadcast studios. But Herb Morrison and his report about the arrival of the Hindenburg was a game changer. On May 6, 1937, following a transatlantic flight, the German dirigible Hindenburg caught fire just short of its mooring mast at the Lakehurst, New Jersey Naval Air Station. The Hindenburg burned and crashed to the ground within seconds. Morrison, a reporter from WLS Radio in Chicago, Illinois, was there, experimenting with a new mobile recording unit when the Hindenburg caught fire. He recorded what he witnessed, quickly losing his reporter's subjectivity as he was overwhelmed by the tragedy unfolding in front of him. His recording was broadcast the next day on WLS Radio, the first live on location radio report. Here is a segment of Morrison's story. The Hindenburg left Frankfurt, Germany, yes, uh, Tuesday even rather, at 7.30 their time. And for better than two and a half days, they've been speeding through the skies over miles and miles of water here to America. Now they're coming in to make a landing of the Zeppelin. I'm going to step out here and uh, cover it from the outside. So as I move out, we'll just stand by a second. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. We're out now outside of the hangar. And what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mast. The mighty diesel motors just roared, their propellers sliding into the air and throwing it back into a gale-like whirlpool. No wonder this great floating palace can travel through the air at such a speed with these powerful motors behind it. Now, the field that we thought active when we first arrived has turned into a moving mass of cooperative action. The landing crews have rushed to the post, the post and spots and orders are being passed along and last-minute preparations are being completed for the moment we have waited for so long. 
The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather, riding as though it was mighty, mighty proud of the place it's playing in the world's aviation. The ship is no doubt bustling with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows, looking down the field ahead of them, getting their glimpse of the mooring mass. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship, and uh, it's been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It's burst into flames. Get it, Charlie. Get it, Charlie. It's right, and it's crashing. It's rising terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's running, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning bath, and all the folks between that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's... It's, 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 it's flashing. Monday. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. It is, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the frame is crashing to the ground. Not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just feeding around it. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people. His friends are out there. It's a... It's, it's a oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. On his sit leg, there are massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk as a craving lady. I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. Charlie, that's terrible. I, 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 listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I've, I've, I've sort of recovered from the terrific explosion and a terrific crash that occurred just as it was being pulled down to the mooring mass. The terrible amount of uh, hydrogen gas in it just caused the, the tail surface broke into flame first, then there was a terrific explosion, and that followed by the burning of the nose and the crashing nose into the ground, and everybody tearing back at freight neck speed to get out from underneath it because it was over the people at the time it burst into flames. Now, whether it fell on the people who were witnessing it, we do not know. But as it exploded, they rushed back. And now it's smoking a terrific black smoke floating up into the sky. The flames are still leaping maybe 30, 40 feet from the ground, the entire 811 feet length of it. They're frantically calling for uh, ambulances and things. The wires are being hu uh, humming with uh, activity. And uh, I, I've, I've lost my, my breath several times during this exciting moment here. And will you pardon me just a moment? I'm not going to stop talking. I'm just going to swallow several times until I can keep on. From the 1930s to the 1950s, during the so-called golden age of radio, numerous radio dramas explored many approaches to storytelling with sounds. Perhaps the most famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, was The War of the Worlds, performed by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air, October 30, 1938. Here is a very condensed version to give you a sense of how well radio storytelling with sounds worked. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Good heavens, something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Wait a minute, something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror, and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires, the, the gas tanks, tanks of the automobiles. Spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. 
Ladies and gentlemen, incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as Martians approach. The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. A hundred yards away, it's, it's 50 feet. Ah, strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study, writing down this last chapter of the record. When their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Clean cut, hard and silent under the dawn of that last great day. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations coast to coast has brought you the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Radio, as the primary storytelling medium, was challenged by the arrival of television, but was not easily displaced. This demonstration by Stan Freeberg, called Stretching the Imagination, pushed back against competition from television in 1965 by showing how well radio could do what television could not. Radio? Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> Okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream to the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. Cue the Air Force. Maraschino cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. No doubt, listening to Stretching the Imagination, you visualized the sounds you heard in your mind's eye. That's the important point about storytelling with sounds. Sound seizes and stimulates your imagination, creates a visual world in your mind, and promotes a sense of engagement and interactivity. What other approaches might we take to storytelling with sounds? One answer is by layering sounds to build up a narrative, as demonstrated in this example called Citophony by Barrett Golding. Let's build a city. We'll need a lot of people. And buildings. And traffic. People in the city are restless. We better add commotion. The city is glamorous. It's exciting. And a little dangerous. Let's go to a restaurant. Let's go to a club.
In the city, I feel like I'm in a giant stadium, participating in the greatest of spectator sports. We all watch each other. Another method is to interview interesting people and use their voices as the basis for storytelling. I recorded this next example called Sausage Man in Germany, where there is a tradition of men selling hot sausages on city streets. These vendors offer sausages cooked and kept warm using portable cooking devices, which make distinctive sounds when their metal compartment doors are opened and closed. Do you come here all the time then and no, no, do this? It's just on just special it's, occasion. It's just for you. I, I have been uh, on Monday already here for a service club. They had also the tour. It was a, a German or a Hof uh, a service club. And I did uh, for the 25th annual. If you would like to watch it, it's on Deutsche Welle, which. Uh, and uh, you just uh, give in uh, in, in Google uh, Hof Sausage Wender. Mütlerreuth, and you will see a, a, a reportage about a 20, well, I'll say 10 minutes. Excellent. I'm guiding you through the, the, the hometown, and we end here in Mütlerreuth. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Tell me about being a sausage man. How, did you, uh, how did you start? <laughs> I'm not a, a butcher. I'm not a, uh, I didn't learn in a bakery. I'm a, actually, I was a long time in the military, and uh, after a while, I thought I don't want to work for anybody else I just work for myself I don't work for the butcher I have normally regular uh, three different butcheries in my of seven sausage existent uh, assortment and uh, yeah I'm just a real sale of uh, warm sausages in the street you, it's, uh, if I'm being downtown on a certain spot it's a nutrition and the a tradition from 1871 so we're talking about 150 years I'm not quite as old as I look but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's quite common in Hof so we have also an own monument uh, where people are very proud of where you see in stone uh, a guy with a, a small uh, bowl whatever you call it. and uh, it's still fired by charcoal I, I in this way, the vegetarian inside is electric, but this is the original um, bowl. Uh, I use it every day in the street, and it's every day. It's not not electric. It's not uh, f uh, done with uh, electricity. It is done by maybe you could uh, get the sound. That's the the, the, the fire uh, pan, and you see flowing charcoal underneath. Mm -hmm. And this uh, you arrange the temperature by the flaps. If you close it, it's less uh, of air oxygen, and uh, so it will burn less. If you open it, it's the temperature is so rising. Every day you are on the except same place. On the same place, same except place, Sunday. Same street. Mm -hmm. Every day, except when you do a special. Yeah, I'm all over Germany. Normally, I'm doing for bigger companies, uh, industries. I'm doing like fairs. I'm uh, all over Germany. I have been also in, in Czech. I have been in France. I have been last uh, Sunday, uh, s Saturday. I was up at the Bremen, Bremen area. Yeah, there was a big plant also for a, a local industry, and uh, they had like a family day. And the guy who runs the place, he invited me for something special to show the people up there. Uh -huh. How long have you been doing this? Fif I'm close to 15 years. 15 years. Yes. 
and you never thought of doing anything else. I do, I do, I do something else. I'm also uh, kind of the president of uh, of uh, uh, supporting a club for the film festival in in Ho, and I'm also doing with seven other friends. We're doing a big fair, which is every year for ten days in the in the in town. Uh, a, a kind of we call it Volksfest, which is a, a kind of lunar park with a big tent with humba, humba music and a beer garden, and we can serve at the same time six thousand people, people if you want to. So, in all those years, nearly fifteen years, you must have had some amazing adventures. Yeah, I, I meet every day different people, new people and uh, it's interesting that I don't have to call anybody you know people call me if they need me but I don't call my my customers and say would you like to have sausage today they're just showing up and the normal way is that they eat always the same you know even if you have a variety in there uh, they normally eat the same sausage whatever what they had before what, what do you think might be one of your most interesting adventures well, or adventures yeah there are some uh, actually uh, one time was uh, i'm standing right in front of a, a, a textile a re retailer uh, fashion label and one uh, guy went in there and he stole a leather jacket, white, most ex uh, very expensive. And uh, uh, the, the shop assistant said, "He just stole a jacket, but he had a, he was injured. He couldn't run." And I followed the, the thief and I got him. And this time I was in a marathon training for for Milan marathon, and I had it like after three thirty meters I, I got him and I, I caught him and I uh, caught the, the jacket and brought it back I didn't do anything to, I didn't harm the guy but uh, I got the jacket and uh, the local newspaper made a story out of it and because it's a, a kind of caray where you go you could go in circle and there's also on the other side there's a small cafe and they were putting up the story that I was running after the sea in circles and the, the crowd which is, was in front of the cafe sitting drinking coffee were, were cheering at me and were uh, supporting me to get the theme. <laughs> it was written in the newspaper as a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a funny way. That's a wonderful story. Yeah, that's a nice story. Oh, will you continue doing this yeah. as long as you can? Yeah. Can you imagine doing that? Yeah, actually, as long as I'm, I'm healthy, I will do it. In winter, it's quite cold here in this area. We're, we're talking about below minus 10. Then I, I quit working. Yeah, but the, the rolls will start to, to freeze. Uh, the, the, the sausage won't, but the, the first thing which uh, uh, freezes is the, the mustard and then the, the buns. <laughs> well, what a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you. And I appreciate you just going to turn this off. <laughs> You are listening to Reimagined Radio. In this episode, we're exploring storytelling with sounds. I'm John Barber. We will continue with more sounds and more stories after we thank our sponsors. Big thank you to Craft Cannabis, formerly known as New Vansterdam, for their ongoing support of KXRW Vancouver Radio. Craft Cannabis is Vancouver's premier cannabis market for those 21 years of age and over. Visit craftcannabis.com to view an order from their full online menu. And they offer in-store, curbside, and touchless pickup to better serve you. Craft Cannabis is located in the Heights Shopping Center on the corner of Mill Plain and Andreessen Road. Open 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., 365 days a year. More information available at craftcannabis.com. Court-appointed special advocates for children known as CASA, are volunteers who advocate for the best interest of children who have come into the care of the state as a result of abuse, neglect, or abandonment. You can lend your voice and volunteer with CASA to change a child's story. CASA offers virtual info sessions and training. If interested, now is the time to get involved with CASA and make a lasting difference in the lives of children and families in the foster care system. 
Clark County CASA is a program of the YWCA of Clark County. More information available at casaclarkcounty.org. KXRW Radio would like to help spread the word about food availability in Clark County for people in need in this extraordinary time. If you need food, Clark County Food Bank's partners are located in 21 sites throughout Clark County. The complete list is updated daily. You can find it at clarkcountyfoodbank.org. Once you're there, click on the button that says Get Food During COVID-19. If you can't visit a distribution site, ask a friend or neighbor to go in your place. They'll be able to pick up a food box for you. If you or a friend can't make it, email info at clarkcountyfoodbank.org. They may be able to deliver food to your door in some situations. And finally, if you would like to help, go to clarkcountyfoodbank.org and click on the Donate button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Every dollar donated will help meet the food needs of our most vulnerable population. Thank you. Welcome back to Reimagined Radio. In this episode, we have considered several different examples of storytelling with sounds. A final example is oral history, an account of a place or event by someone present during the narrative being shared. In this example, I recorded Shirley Howard recounting some of her experiences working for the Northern Pacific Railroad in Washington State mid-20th century. I added sound effects to create a story easily imagined as a conversation with Ms. Howard aboard a train pulled by a steam locomotive. As you will hear, this is an important detail. Shirley Howard, previously Shirley Marie James, born in Spokane, Washington, at the Deaconess Hospital, August 14, 1926. I grew up in somewhat in Seattle and a year in Wenatchee, but mostly in Spokane. Went to school at North Central High School. After high school, always thought I'd be a secretary. But the news in the paper talked about a Spokane Telegraph School that railroad people could learn Morse code, work on the railroad, and earn so much money. <laughs> so it just worked out fine that I went, I thinking four months approximately to telegraph school and Went to work then for the Northern Pacific Railroad. My first spot was Sprague, Washington, and I would go and uh, rent a room with someone in Sprague. Of course, you worked three shifts preferably day shift, but that doesn't happen to new employees. I worked uh, midnight till eight the first time I went to work. When I began work, it was, we worked seven days a week. And about a year later, maybe not even that long, it's six days a week, and then five days a week. And after you worked a year, you could have a week vacation after two years, two weeks vacation, and I'm not remembering the amount when I quit. I had still some time due. I had worked four and a half years to Little experience that startled me. We had what we called an order board to move big levers in the office a certain way to tell the train that there's an order board out with a train order. Well, I could not budge this order board when I first tried it. I had all my weight and, and I had practice and I was alone then. And I got up onto the counter and put 
all my weight, and it finally moved, but that was a little unnerving. Our order boards told the train exactly what was happening before they, they could see the light and the movement before they got to our office. The train orders were our main item. The uh, engineer would put his arm out the window and I would stand beside the track close to the engine and those engines were enormous. And I do believe that's why I'm a little hard of hearing. You had a long pole with a Y and a string across the top and the orders were tied in the string. And we had to copy these orders from the dispatcher. The, the dispatchers were our main communicators. They put out the train orders from the office in Spokane, sometimes really fast because the train was just about there. So it was often hurry, hurry, hurry. You soon learn to be mighty careful. And we had some really fine dispatchers. After a few weeks at Sprague, I went to Ritzville. And from there on out to the other side of Pasco, to a little spot called Badger, there were three of us women in the office. We slept right in the little station. We had no electricity. We had a little old stove that we cooked on and uh, another stove that we had in the office and warmed up. We had an outhouse. We had a cistern for water, which eventually gave me a yellow jaundice. And I came back into Spokane for some care then, and, but went back. One time we had a little track fire, and that was a little exciting, but it burned out. But you didn't know at night what it was. And it, but evidently it just sparks and grass and whatever's on the, near the track. But there wasn't much up there to burn. It was barren, pretty barren land, not trees. A really interesting life. There were we three women and the sheep herder and nothing around. On the railroad, you have seniority and you bid on a job there or there. And sometimes we would have a change of uh, personalities. Trainmen were so nice, they would throw off newspapers or whatever we would ask for. And I would ride sometimes into town with the, what do we call the little speed cars on the track, track man, and do a little shopping. Not off, not off. Out of Badger, we would have somebody drive out, you know, to visit us some relatives or somebody, and uh, to try and fix something without having a good stock in the cupboard was not easy. But living in a little station like that, you don't have any extra comforts, but you don't think about it. Just do what you do. As I uh, spent about a year and a half at Badger, then I bid in a job in Pasco, which was a big terminal, and I learned a lot in a hurry there. It was a, always afternoons or midnights when I would work, and that is where I met uh, uh, my friend, like a sister to me. She worked in the, as a clerk in the office, and we stayed together then for about two and a half years, and that is where I met my husband. He was a conductor out of Wishram to Pasco. Good looking. <laughs> and he happened to like me too, so we went to the movies quite a bit. I don't think we missed many movies in those days. Got better acquainted and decided to marry. My family would come to visit us in Pasco quite often. Our Pasco was great. It was a busy, during the war, a lot of troop trains. I could go to the window right by the desk and I could wave, but I, you know, you didn't see many of the men get off. But I would hear about how well fed they were. 
on the train. When I was in high school, probably five different young men that I went to school with didn't make it home from the serving their time. My friend, my girlfriend, my like her sister, she worked out at Hanford. She also contacted cancer and she died about 10 years later. And we're quite sure that that had something to do with it, Hanford. I heard a whole new language on the railroad at times. Not good, because I hadn't, my folks didn't ever use language like that. But the railroad people, I find most of them have a good heart and would help you do something if you needed help. I still have some people here that I can talk to that are, uh, you know, old friends and one a dispatcher. I just talked to him this morning and he was a dispatcher here and he went to the same telegraph school younger, a little younger than I am. I said, I cannot remember how much money I made a month when I started. And he took out his little black book this morning. He still had written down what he made years ago when he started working, $1.68 an hour. And his first, in fact, I wrote it down, 1971, he made $1,100 a month. And that was a lot, you know, in 1971. But the booklet does say that we only made like $297 a month, approximately. And I just haven't thought about it and haven't a good, clear recollection. I know it seemed like a lot of money to me. But meanwhile, back to all the telegraph Morse code and so forth. Fascinating and not hard. Not hard to learn. They say a child can learn it. <laughs> we had uh, what we called just a, a regular telegraph key. I can't do it for you, but I still, in my mind, I could sit and, and do it. I did have a girlfriend who was really good with code. She worked in uh, Tacoma and Seattle in the bigger offices of the NP, Northern Pacific. I, I don't know for sure, but, but the thing that changed telegraphy, telegraphers, radios on the trains and uh, you don't have any more telegraphers, which telegraphers used to say, how can they run the trains without us? And that's how radios. In Wish Ram, where I lived, I didn't work then. We had lots of baby showers in Wish Ram. And I had, I had Donna then the first year or so. I was busy and lots of good friends in Wishroom. Had a good time in Wishroom. I have a friend there that she's 102 now, Laura. Her husband died at 105 not long ago. Saw a lot of uh, railroad uh, hobos, bums, fed a few. My husband had a little restaurant he started before railroading in uh, he sold a bowl of beans and a piece of bread, I think, for five cents. The last train, the engine, steam engine that worked at Wishram, that really worked, I took pictures because my husband wasn't home to take the pictures. And that was a, a scary situation because he took movies, but he had it all set up. I think I've got a picture someplace, but. That's hard to describe. The steam engines we loved, we still love them because they're, they just talk to you. It's just different than this diesel just goes down the track and they just blow their certain sounding whistles so different than anything else. 
a, a real, real, real rotor gets excited about a steam engine. I've been on them, but I've never really ridden any distance. Have you ever heard of the 700 engine? It's kind of famous, and it still takes people on a tour once in a while. After I married, I stopped working for 20 years, and then we moved to Vancouver, and my girlfriend said they're hiring part-time down at the office. So I went down and went to work for another 10 years or more, earned a pension, which I deeply appreciate. The railroad is good employer. I'm really blessed to have chosen the job I happened to decide on. I don't know what else I would have liked or who I would have met a finer man. And railroad's good for people. You have just heard Storytelling with Sounds, an episode of Reimagined Radio. We examined how sounds, like the storyteller's voice and sound effects, have contributed to storytelling since the dawn of human history. This has been a production of Reimagined Radio. Please visit our website, www.reimaginedradio.net, for information about Reimagined Radio, our performances, and to subscribe to our snappy email newsletter. That's www.reimaginedradio, all one word, no punctuation, dot net. Sound design for this program by John Barber. Post-production by Martin John Gallagher. Social media by Regina Carroll, social media and photography. Graphic design by Holly Slocum Design. A big thanks to all our listeners who support programming like Reimagined Radio with their contributions. If you would like to help support our efforts, please visit the KXRW website. That's kxrw.fm. Scroll down the page and engage with the donate button. This is John Barber, producer and host of Reimagined Radio. It has been my pleasure to talk with you about storytelling with sounds. Thank you so much for listening. Until later, take care and listen to the sounds around you. They all have stories to tell. Hi there. Are you a fan of all things horror? Yeah? You are? Well, in that case, find Tuesday Terrors, which is the mutual audio feed that comes out on a Tuesday, believe it or not. Shock horror, I know. But if you subscribe there, you'll find amazing horror fiction audio in your player every Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday Terrors. Subscribe to the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.